No, that's saying a lot. I just think that, um, uh, like, I just like how y'all, but y'all did just a great job of really putting flesh to his biography, of making this into like a human, or, or a human being. And I was thinking about like, you know, how you were talking about his, um, he, you know, went to school out in California. And he wrote for the California Eagle, had a little editorial column. And he was talking about uh, women, uh, you know, really being uh, positive role models, how black women were treated. How they were perceived by society. I think, in a lot of ways, while I read, you know, his his column, which y'all said about it, he was a, he was ahead of the curve as far as seeing uh, that women, the way we were trained and treat black women, were very important. Um, we, uh, we as a black community, and uh, I think for me also that you know what part? How much would you say that Dr. Howe was a religious man? Well, yes, um, and. Part of what he said, he thought that religion should be practical. And mm-hmm. um, when he was, um, we have a picture, I think, of him at a Methodist church because he became a Seventh Day Adventist uh, because Dr. Will Mason influenced that in him. But they didn't have any black Seventh Day Adventist church, so he went to the Methodist church. Uh, after he went to medical school, and he started um, actually practicing medicine. I think he stepped a little bit away from the church. And I think the reason for that is time. Um, he was giving his attention to uh, the practice of medicine, so he could not or did not spend as much time in church as he did when he was younger. But um, you ask if I think that he was a re- religious man. Yes, I do. I think he had faith. I think he had values. I think he uh, believed in a higher power. And I think he stepped to that. I also want to ask you because we talking about Maverick, and you know, uh, recently a uh, person that was labeled Maverick with John McCain because of his ability uh, to work across the the aisle with the other party. And I was thinking about some political choices that Dr. Howard made. We all know that he was a Republican, but that was not necessarily unusual uh, for a black person during that time period to be a Republican. If you think about, you know, the fact that the first Republican president was. Abraham Lincoln and you know Frederick Douglass was talking about how he was a, a Republican through and through one of our greatest black leaders but I was just thinking about when he helped out with the uh, gubernatorial campaign of Upton Sinclair now you know we know Upton Sinclair was this great novelist who wrote the book The Jungle that talked about the meat packing industry but at the same time he said some very uh, degrading things about black folk in that book and also at the time he wrote the letter uh, to Simpson Bilbo about building a hospital a veterans administration hospital uh, in Mount Bio, I believe. Uh, how can he explain his uh, ability to work with folks who are, could be deemed, I guess, uh, less than friendly to black folks? Oh, absolutely. Well, let me say one thing before I get on that, and that was mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. religion. Dr. Howard would say a prayer before every operation. He prayed for the person before he operated on them. So mm-hmm. that allows you to know that he believed in prayer. Now, I understand um, uh, Howard's political leanings in a way. One thing about even a racist like Bilbo, he respected Howard for being a man and standing up for what he believes. Mm -hmm. And I think the same with Upton Sinclair. It's it's sort of like the idea that if you whine and you cow down to me, I have no respect for you. But if you stand up, and even if I don't like it or I don't agree with it, then I ha- have respect for you being the man that you are. And in fact, that was the relationship he ended up creating with Bilbo because just to be able to talk to him just blew me away. Right, but, I was just um, digging it. Good. They, they laugh about it and talk about it, but because he wasn't afraid, he was not afraid. He he give it to them just like it is and say, we're going to do it this way. No, we, we need this, this. This bill has come down. This ruling has come down on Brown versus the board. And Mississippi will abide by the law. And he didn't cow down. And they had respect for him. And when you say, well, Republicans versus Democrats, um, Charles Evers is a Republican. There's no point in being afraid. We went in the army and fought for this country. World War II came back here and couldn't enjoy nothing. So we said, no. We're not going to handle that no more. We're not going to go and fight people we don't even know. And come mm-hmm. in and can't enjoy the thing that we fought for democracy. And we can't register. We can't vote. We can't go to the public restroom. We couldn't drink out of the water fountain. We couldn't go to 
country and the hotels, the motels, we couldn't do any of that kind of stuff. But white folks could, and we said, no, that's not going to happen anymore in Mississippi. So he and I and Aaron Hen and Fandu Hamer, Dr. T.R.M. Howard, got to get organized and start trying to get black folks involved in fighting for our rights. And we put out signs that don't buy gas, we can't use a restroom. And we can't use a restroom uh, in the public, in the uh, service station. So we, we put a fight on for that. Medgar and Dr. Hamer and all of us together. Medgar saw a lady, we just supported him. I'm glad you did. I'm glad you brought some, uh, some of those people, especially Dr. T.R.M. Howard. Yeah. How big of an influence was he? Because he's kind of like marginalized now. People don't even remember who he was. Oh, he great influence on, on, on us. So he was the man in Mountain Bayer who had stood up and fought for us when uh, when no one else did. You know, but with all respect to Dr. To Dr. King, I love him to death. But Dr. Howard and Medgar and Aaron were out there fighting long before Dr. King came along. In Mississippi, now we went all over the country in Mississippi. Right. Well, it's like you go ground zero. Mm. Hams and more and people like that. Yeah. Oh, you know, like Dr. Chiarmi mean, Howard was one of the richest black men in Mississippi, correct? He was at that time. He died, you know. Mm hmm. Yeah, he died. He moved. He, he got in trouble and he finally left with Chicago and he died. He, he, was, he, was, he, was, yeah, he was very wealthy and, and tough. But he realized he made his money off of. Back in them days, you know, we were Negroes and colors, so we were colored out what they were, and we, we changed every 10 years, so I think we <laughs> Farmers who were losing their jobs because they were trying to vote, trying to register to vote. Yeah. And he was on the board of, um, you know, Tri-State Bank in Memphis, and so he put a lot of money in, and like almost in just a very short period of time, they get it up to over $300,000. And then they put even more trying to get it close to a million. So they have plenty of money so that the children, the parents could pay their bills and the children could eat.